Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Ingersoll Councillor Khadija Howru, located in the heartland of Ontario Southwest in beautiful Oxford County. The town of Ingersoll offers its visitors a unique mixture of leisure and recreational activities set against the backdrop of history and nature. From a small farming community on the banks of the historic Thames River to a warm and vibrant town of over 12,000 people, Ingersoll is a community rich in history and culture. From culture venues such as museums, theaters, and art galleries to outdoor adventures such as hiking, cycling, fishing, and snowmobiling, you'll find what you're looking for in an Ingersoll. Located with an easy driving distance of London and Woodstock, Ingersoll is the perfect destination for both day trippers and vacationers alike. So come for the day, come for the night, or come for the week and discover what Ingersoll has to offer you. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Khadija Howard. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start uh, by asking you a question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show. So you're no exception to this question. And it's about getting to know you as a councillor and getting to know the person behind the title a little bit. But where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Khadija? Thank you, Chris, for having me. And uh, again, like every politician, I imagine either you had it from the start or you never thought you would be uh, finding yourself in that situation. I was one of those who um, I've always believed in being a change maker, regardless of position. You know, when I see something, I call it out. When I think I can share something, I go publicly to social media and I share my my mind. Um, and I'm kind of a very strong community person, so I try to get into my community and so doing that and meeting a lot of people over the years, um, I kind of sense the similarities and the problems and, you know, the aspirations of everyone. So um, along the line, I actually was encouraged to run by my friend and deputy mayor. She um, encouraged me to consider running because she thought I had a voice. Um, and I, I always knew I had this voice, except I wasn't sure if anyone was ready for me. Um, and so that encouragement and asking my family, they thought I should take that leap made me realize that, okay, if I don't have representation there, I guess they'll never hear what I feel or how I um, understand things. And I had a community supporting me. So that's how I decided to run. Do you mind me asking a, a, a stupid follow-up, but it's an important one in that context of that yeah. answer there. What do you mean by people weren't yeah. ready for you? Is just your ideas? And, 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 and I so, don't want Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So in the context of that, I'm the first black Muslim woman um, to run. And it was for a community that is predominantly white. Um, I've been here only eight years uh, and I, I've been involved in politics, going out for all the debates in the prior elections, you know, asking my questions and doing my bit. But I never really thought of them being ready to have me represent. Um, and essentially, even though um, I thought I was already doing that, um, the encouragement made me step up to actually run for office. Thank you for that clarification. I just want to make sure <laughs> I, I put that on the record. So 2022 is the first election that you stand. From what I can gather, you, you yes. could have ran in previous elections. But had you 
ever considered running for politics prior to 2022? Or was it not until that conversation with the deputy mayor that sort of sparked that saying, okay, now it's the time for Khadija to step up and actually uh, be that change maker that she wants to be for her community? Or had it been burning inside you prior to that? And it wasn't until 2022 that you finally said, okay, now it's time. Now it's time to put my name on I, I, I had never considered running for office anywhere. I've been on the PTA boards, you know, I've been in community groups and um, I'm a director of a nonprofit, but I never wanted to run publicly. Uh, not just to think of even running in a community where I was a real minority. So that was just kind of, hmm, yeah. <laughs> so what was it about the municipal level of government that decided that you decided it was the best place to start at? Because you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen school board, you could have chosen county, <laughs> but you chose yeah. true, truly local town of Ingersoll Council. What um, was that decision yes. based on? It was based on the fact that people knew me, um, that I had the connections to the community. Uh, when I moved here, I had a business. Um, I had a business uh, manufacturing skincare products, and I had a, you know, a small food business. Um, and one of the things I said to myself was, oh, my God, I've got to get myself out there or no one would know me or even trust me to even you know buy from me. So I needed a front facing uh, location. And so I went downtown and I saw their location and I opened my first skincare store in Ingersoll. Um, and that was my foundation. That was how I got to meet everyone who truly needed my natural skincare solutions. And those one-on-one -on -one conversations and learning from the old uh, folks and, you know, opening doors and having them come in and say, hey, I've been to Africa. I lived in Nigeria for some years. Or I lived in Kenya for some years. Or I lived, and I'm just like blown away with all the stories that I hear. So I feel like at the time that it was you know, there was an opportunity to run. What well, better than really represent the people that now know you? At that point, that's where I felt more comfortable. And I, I really, truly don't feel that in that beginning, I would have made any difference at the municipal or federal level. So, yeah. You've now been elected for roughly about a year and a half give or take a few months, depending on if you're listening to this when it airs or listening to it a little bit later. <laughs> but as of recording, you've been elected for about a year and a half. I've got to ask sort of the stupid follow up, the stupid question to start the questioning about your life of a counselor. But is it what you expected? Is the life of a counselor what you expected <laughs> prior to being elected to where you are now? I think I had some expectation um, of what it was, what it should be uh, in my <laughs> case. Yes. <laughs> And, and so far, so good, except, yes, it, there's challenges. Uh, for me, as a, as a visible minority, I come with a different perspective. And it's sometimes been, um, just to be fair to everyone else, a little bit of more, you know, explaining and making them understand where I'm coming from because it's not the norm. Um, and I think that's why diverse uh, governments or diverse councils work. Uh, because then there's that fresh perspective or that's that new way of looking at things that we have to deliberate and it makes it a bit more interesting, but it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> you you have had to make some pretty tough choices over the last year and a half, I can imagine, because you were the yeah. closest to the people. Uh, the decisions you make impact the people the next day. And I say the next day, some, sometimes it takes a few days, yeah. sometimes it's like immediate, but the decisions you make impact people more than potentially the county, the provincial or the federal government when making those tough choices, because at the end of the day, you are that vote. You, you have yeah. that decision-making you have, you have the ability to change a little bit uh, what's going on in the community. How do you come to the decision of how you're going to vote on issues that are presented in front of council? You have your agenda package, but at the end of the day, you have to do all the work and you have to try to make sure that what you're voting on and how you're voting is going yeah. to impact people positively, but not in a harsh way, if that makes sense. Yeah. So at the end of every, um, at the end of the day, we get all the information that we kind of deliberate on. I take my time to study. I study, I read, I learn, I ask questions. 
Um, I, I could ask questions even of my peers before we head on. I mean, as a new counselor, I ask my questions every day. Uh, and, and I said to myself, the questions that I have are the same questions the community has. So I'm going to ask them and ask them publicly because the questions uh, need answers sometimes for it to be shared with the community. So instead of ask my questions privately, I would rather ask them publicly um, and then study enough to know where I stand on, an, on a matter and be able to defend that choice. Um, and I think that's why my debates will be more like a follow-up question and a follow-up question or a follow-up argument or to a follow-up argument uh, because I feel like I truly do need to fight that decision that I've made uh, because most times, again, it comes from a place where it's not been the norm on how to do it things that way or it's a totally new idea, sounds like a crazy idea, but in my mind, I've either lived it before, I've seen it before, I've experienced it before, and that brings that added perspective to what we discuss at our table. So when I make a decision, it's because I can back it up and I fight it through. <laughs> How important is it to for you to listen to the community? Because you, 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 get, you get to ask the questions and some people, like, I don't want to say, I don't want to paint a broad stroke here, but I'm going to a little bit here because it seems like I do that a lot on the show because it's my show and I get to paint the broad strokes. But how, how important is it for you to listen to all sides of an issue prior to making that decision? Because I'm assuming you've come to the realization that not 100% of the people are never going to be happy with what a counselor does or a mayor does or a council does in general. Yeah. How important is it for you to listen to all sides before coming to that decision? And But do it in a respectful manner because I would never want someone to go into a situation where they're getting abused or getting yelled at or getting screamed at. But at the end of the day, people have the right, because you're an elected official, to voice their concerns about an issue that's presented in front of them. Is that important to you? Yes, very, very important to me uh, because before I'm a counselor, I'm a resident yeah. um, and I experience the same things that every resident experiences. So I value very much when my residents email, uh, when they talk to us and ask questions. Um, I look at an email to make sure that it's sent to uh, council or me if an issue is something that we all need to to be aware of. But I do have local concerns like my neighborhood or some people around me that would specifically send me an email saying, hey, I really think you should, you know, look at this issue or that issue I, I make a point to visit my residents to ask and kind of get context on what they're saying. And if I need to defend them, I defend them. Uh, but I found a few times where I've actually had to go to explain to individuals how council works and how that decision can be made and how we're already either on it or, yes, you have every right to have thought it that way. But I find that educating people along the way is really helping them to understand how we function as a government and how they can be more effective at communicating with government. So, and I think part of the responsibility of a counselor is to do just that because not everybody's um, complaint is insane. Sometimes it could start off that way, but when you dig down, that person has reasons. And I've learned so much from listening to my fellow residents and learned history. Because like I said, I've only been here eight years. Um, I've learned history of how things happen and how this happened and how that's been happening. And so then you're able to kind of walk it back and, and understand. And then I could ask even more questions or better questions of the staff or each other. You you bring up a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and that is education, but also apathy. Um, I have noticed that there has been a increased apathetic nature when it comes to municipal politics and municipal governance. 20 years ago, you would see people who actually want to attend council meetings and sit in the gallery and listen to the debates. It'd be hard pressed to find people who actually want to show up and actually sit in those council meetings today. Do you find no. that in Ingersoll, people are engaged and people are willing to give you those feedbacks and willing to talk to you about the issues that are in, presented in front of council? Or is it like these old saying go, as long as my water's turned on and my garbage is picked up, I'm comfortable with what the council's doing, as long as it doesn't negatively <laughs> affect me that much? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> we are. 
I think we are engaged to an extent. I would love to see more engagement for sure. Um, but I do think that the, the few people who do have something to offer, who do engage, engage very well. Uh, we get a lot of um, emails and yes, gallery is empty, but we have since COVID developed an online platform where you could watch our council meetings every month. Um, and so that allows us to have that accessibility uh, for the residents. Uh, but again, we know how many people are watching and not a lot of people are watching. <laughs> so it's true uh, that you say that, but at the end of the day, I think we're new. So to the extent that people see what we've put in place or what we've fought for, they can kind of tell where we're heading. Are we progressive enough? Are we doing the right thing? And I think there's that lack of, uh, there's no worry anymore. Um, as much as early on where they weren't sure where we stood, but now they can see us kind of moving and chugging along and they're like, oh, okay, okay. And we have two major issues on our hands. So we're kind of making steps in, I guess, the right direction. So people are a bit more comfortable and watching and really quietly now. Before I turn to the issues that are affecting your salt, I want to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. And I apologize, I, I did not, I, I did not think I was going to ask these questions prior to this conversation. But you've mentioned it a few times. Um, I, I have listeners who listen to the show across Canada, and this year alone, Saskatchewan, New, uh, Nova Scotia, the Northwest Territories, Yellowknife are all heading to municipal elections. You are a kind of a, a, a unicorn in some sense because you openly said at the beginning of the episode you were the first black Muslim woman to be elected to a predominantly white community in the town of Ingersoll. What advice would you give to your fellow, and, and I don't want to say black Muslim women out there, but diverse uh, Canadians yeah. who are thinking, I don't have what it takes to represent myself, but also my community because... My community is traditionally a predominantly white community. What advice would you give to that Canadian right now who's thinking about going into your footsteps but isn't sure if it's the right time for them or their community? I would say go for it because it is the right time. Um, Canada has been as multicultural as we have ever been. And uh, until you sit at the table, no one can see how you feel. Um, no one understands really to the extent that you can bring your ideas to life, um, how you're thinking them. And so if you're waiting for the next person to help you, uh, you probably are going to keep waiting. Uh, I think it's time to step up. And one of the things you, if you look at yourself and, and, and see yourself as someone who's been out there, you've been involved in your community, uh, you love what you see, you don't like what you see, and you feel like you have something to offer, I would say step up and go for it because they need your voice. I have my fellow counselors who truly appreciate my perspective. It may be different, it may be hard for them to understand, but they do appreciate that it's new, it's different, and we are working through it. And so I feel like I've been able to achieve some level of understanding. And then at the same time, I now have that platform to continue um, to speak to issues that really affect me and my community or just the diverse community in Ingersoll. So. I would encourage anyone to do it because there's never a better time to do it. Did you have someone that you looked up to prior to putting your name on the ballot to sort of emulate what they went through or what they, uh, I don't want to say dealt with, but because I don't want to go down that path here, but I kind of have to a little bit because while we are a more multicultural community country than we have ever been, and I, I I appreciate that, and I love that about Canada. Canada is one of the best countries that we could ever live in, and I think that the more diverse uh, voices that we have around a council table or in government is better for our community. But there are still parts of this country that that just does not fly. I know from myself as a gay man who's married to uh, a, a immigrant who came to this country, we we got death threats at our, our wedding. We had security at our wedding because it's just the way that it was and people just didn't accept it. Did you ever face a moment where you said, is this the right time for me? Because even though we are more multicultural than we have ever been, there's still parts of this country that just... It, being a black Muslim woman in a small town still doesn't get the recognition that it should. 
Yeah, so I think the way to to um to think that through is for me, I was out there as a person doing what I thought I was doing as a community person. I was injecting my ideas, I was calling things out. I was, you know, being as friendly as I could and being as supportive and helpful as I could when I had the chance. I was attending all my business meetings as a business owner. I was getting to know everyone that I could because I did feel like I had a product. And if people don't know me, perhaps they won't trust me enough to even patronize my business. And so that was my first battle. And for me, it was my own internal, this is what I've got to do to feel comfortable because I do have a lot to offer and I do have a good business. And I do know that I have the confidence in my ideas. So I'm going to speak them because I didn't have anything to lose. And then here comes an election and it almost seemed like I'd been campaigning for eight years because they kind of knew my state of mind. They knew what I stood for. They they believed that I, I had the courage to stand up. Uh, I would call the council out in the past. So now I feel like I didn't have to campaign much. And when I decided to, to put something on my um on my campaign poster, I just said, well, vote me because diversity matters. <laughs> and I remember during the uh, debate, someone asked me, what do I mean by that? And I said, well, if you really think about it, diversity, whether it's in age, whether it's in background, whether it's in you know gender, whether it's in color, it doesn't matter what kind of difference we have. As long as we're all represented, we make the best decisions. So for me, starting with me, I want you to have that um, in your mind when you vote me, because if you keep having the same people, the decisions will never change. And that's kind of what I ran on. But then I did have a very uh, comforting case where I lived in Brampton for many years. I lived in Brampton for 10 years. And before I left, we did voting our first black councillor to the city of Brampton. And she did not have a really great time. <laughs> In fact, I remember, you know, she even threatened um, and got a lawyer because she was charging harassment, you know, at her first time where every time she came up with something, she was challenged. She was she was said she was breaking the law. She was, you know, she was doing her education. And, and you know, when you're new and you don't know enough about something, you really dig in and learn. But then when you speak up, even the rules and regulations that have been there are challenged by the same people who should have known them. And so that there was that kind of case. And so it was interesting that it wasn't going to be easy for me. And I knew that. Uh, but I, I would say because of the relationships that I built, it's actually been a better situation for me. Yeah. So I that was kind of like my role model, but not that role model. <laughs> I, I appreciate that candor and honesty there. And I, 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 I I want to turn to the town of Ingersoll here for a few minutes, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. But prior to doing that, I'm going to uh, sort of preface this line of questioning, as I always do on the show, that this is a conversation between two, between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's oh. opinion. For those who are about to send emails, please don't, because this is her <laughs> opinion. Uh, counselor, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Ingersoll? So, yes, the two big issues that uh, we've had in the community are the fact that we have a housing crisis. Just like many communities do, we do have a high housing crisis. And to my um, knowledge and perspective, we need a mixed housing solution. Um, because prior to even me running, I did recognize that. Coming to this town to rent a place before settling in was like combing through a haystack. You know, it was obvious that there was a rental crisis and even a home ownership uh, crisis. So I do recognize that. And that has been something residents have spoken about. A lot of people are moving. Um, they can't stay here. They have to go into either London or Woodstock before they can finding the, find a space here. It has gotten better for the rental in, in a few years because we did see a lot of influx of home renovations and, you know, investors coming in to rent out spaces. So I think that regardless of how it's happened has improved a, just a tiny little bit. But when it comes to the variety of homes you can even afford to rent or what's available, um, it has always been a more single family home community. So we do need to focus on that. And the second was the 
multi-use recreation that has been uh, the bone of contention. It's old, 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 and the residents have wanted a new one for many, many years. And so we've been kind of praying and hoping we get there. And thank God uh, this council has finally approved the budget for it. And we're looking to just get ahead on it. So I think those two major issues still on the table, but I think the residents can see us trying hard to work through them. Yeah. Uh, I want uh, let's talk about housing for a second because it's a topic that I've been talking about a lot on the show with a lot of municipal leaders across this country. Um, there is two sides to this issue because municipalities do not have any role in actually building the houses. They they can set zoning, they can set parameters, but at the end of the day, developers have to come and actually build this, this uh, diverse type of housing. What is the town of Ingersoll doing today to address that uncertainty that unless the developers come, the housing isn't going to get built? Awesome. And this is exactly <laughs> what I asked. Uh, when I joined <laughs> council, uh, one of the first concerns I had was that, do we have any land ourselves that we can build? because it was clear, if you don't have land, you don't have control. It's private hands that own lands and they will do what they wanna do. And so I'm a policy person. I have a background in public administration. And I do know that um, if you want to raise capital, raise money, solve problems like you know um, housing and other stuff, council has to have their own lands and properties and we have seen all over the world, I lived in the UK for a bit, and you can tell councils own homes and that's why London can house people. So if you don't have your own land and your own assets, it's really hard. And with this whole government you know, um, target, um, the first question I wanted to really get off the ground was if we do have land. And at that time we didn't. Um, so we were definitely focused on that because yes, everyone agreed that until we have our own land, we really can't dictate what happens. And so proactively, uh, we've been kind of working on that and we did get through the year with some acquisition of land that we now own. Uh, and it's going to basically solve both problems. We're going to be able to build a Merck, uh, and we're going to be able to build some housing. Um, so, which is very, very unique for us because we're mainly an industrial town and all our lands are industrial lands. So I think that was a particularly great opportunity for Ingersoll um, that we did acquire some land and we're very, very grateful for that. Do you have buy-in from the community? Because there's the rise of nimbyism in this country is quite large. And there are people who say, I moved to Ingersoll. You moved to Ingersoll eight years ago. I moved to Ingersoll to get that sort of culture and that atmosphere of a small town living where everyone knows everyone, where you walk down the street, you know who your neighbors are, you know the business owner that you go into that store. Mm -hmm. In Ingersoll, do you get a sense that people want to see this diverse type of housing come into the community so that way they understand? I don't want to say they understand because we just talked about apathy and not understanding, but they yeah. get the fact that if more people come, more people live, more houses get built, property taxes are not going to exponentially go up because the tax base is going to be uh, increasing and the service levels are going to be potentially increasing as well. Do you get a sense that people want to see this uh, change and get more housing built in your community? Or is there a sense that, no, we want that out of our community. We don't want more housing because we love the way that Ingersoll uh, is. I have gotten emails reminding <laughs> me why I to Ingersoll and why we don't need all this housing and how we don't need all this crowd. And I've gotten emails, you know, with people saying we need more housing, we need more housing, you need to do more about housing. So essentially change is never easy for anyone. Yeah. And most community members are would remember that for so many years, they were stuck on doing so many things and so many projects. And I try to remind people that without more people, we don't have money. Without more people coming in to, to you know, help expand the base, we don't have money to do stuff. And so in the last few years, if we now have money to do stuff, thank the new people who've come in to help, you know, contribute to that tax base. And so whatever our situation, we are lucky. We're still a very small, you know, footprint. We're never going to be as big as 
Toronto. We're never going to be as big as, you know, a big city like even London. So we are going to have to be very crafty in how we plan our, you know, region, how we mix use for residential and how we offer recreation. Um, and I think this acquisition we got has gone, you know, 100% solving that problem for us. It's going to be in a new extension part of town. It's not kind of cramping us in the middle of town, closer to the highway. So it's an opportunity to build a whole new city that is a part of our city. So I try to make people understand that change is new, uh, change is good sometimes, and you've got to accept that it's either the status quo where you can't afford anything, or now with more people, we can afford something and share it. And so that's kind of how I how I position myself. Yeah. Growth comes with challenges, though, because uh, municipalities are facing infrastructure deficits across this country right now. And I'm assuming Ingersoll is no exception to that rule. If you grow your community, you build more houses, that means that infrastructure has to improve. Is the infrastructure set up in your community, whether that be wastewater treatment facilities, whether that be water pipelines, roads, is Ingersoll set up for potential growth in the future? Or are you balancing the growth? And I say you as the royal you as the uh, the the council is the council balancing growth with the realities that the growth comes with infrastructure challenges as well. Yes, um, and and that's it. Everyone is going through that and that infrastructure, but we are, I would say, lucky uh, in the sense that we've been proactively doing things um, in maintenance and upgrading stuff that. But now we can expand and connect more than have to redo everything, which is why I think we've been in a, very, in a, in a better place than most, some municipalities. And again, because of the whole acquisition is happening in a whole new area of town, it's getting its whole new um, connection facilities. It's getting everything um, new, you know, the roads and, and the pipelines and the waters and the sewage is all going to be newly connected. Um, because again, we now own the land and we know what we're going to do with it. It's not even going to happen in phases. It's going to be done prior to all those buildings coming up. So we are in a very unique situation where um, that just kind of fell in our laps at the right time. And we have to do things accordingly. Uh, in fact, we are about to start looking at as many grants to to help us get most of you know those builds off the ground as all the government's um, targets have promised <laughs> and we are trying to get ourselves ready for some of that but i think we are poised for growth in a way that is different and unique from other municipalities we don't have all these plots of lands within the city that we now have to develop and we're not really sure or we're going to strain the system and all of that so it's kind of understandable i a good place I'm going to be coming to visit Ingersoll later on this summer. I'm, I'm actually doing a big giant Southwest tour of uh, Southern Southwestern Ontario. And Ingersoll is one of the stops because uh, a you're the deputy mayor, Lindsay Wilson's appeared on the show. Now you've appeared yeah. on the show. So now I really feel a connection to Ingersoll, <laughs> but when I'm there, when I go to communities, I usually try to sort of do those secret conversations with people at Tim Hortons and have this conversation to say, what are the issues that are facing the community? Now, I can imagine if I go to Ingersoll today and ask 100 people or even 10 people, they're not going to say housing and infrastructure and the rec center is their top issue. They may say some very micro issues, potholes. They might say parks, service levels. They may say issues that are not even related to the uh, town, but may be related to the county. How do how do you as a counselor and council balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the community? Because when people pay their property taxes, they want to feel like their money is being spent on their issues and they have the most important issues according to them. So how do you balance the needs with the of the community with the needs of the one? Because and I'm gonna sort of yeah. I, I hate I hate quoting Spock here from Star Trek Rathacon, but here <laughs> I am <laughs> quoting yeah. Spock from Rathacon. How do you do that under the realization that everything costs more, everything is costing a lot more than it was 10 years ago or even two and a half years ago, and people want their issues addressed in a timely fashion? Yeah. And again, I would say lucky for us. 
uh, I think over the years, we've identified the real pain points in the community. And those are our two major pain points. And I tell you, anyone you ask in this community will tell you, we need a new Merck. We need a new Merck. And and, and that's kind of where um, I've, I've embodied this whole sense of pain um, that they, they have. And we are a community that is, again, proactive, our maintenance uh, roads. Uh, we are proactively making sure that everything is on point. Um, so I think the residents appreciate that. But then there is the one resident, yes, that would send that email that, oh my God, I can't address one. I can't address this two. I can't address three. I have to go address all of it. And I pay them a visit and say, hey, I wish you would watch more council meetings. <laughs> we have all this on the table. We talked about this last month. We did this mm -hmm. last year. And so sometimes it takes us having to explain to that resident who, again, might be new, has these issues for him right now, but has lost co context in how we've dealt with some of them already or are dealing with some of them. And so I think with our council meetings being live, and having to go back and replay them and, and understand what we've talked about. And with those major issues being on the agenda for a few uh, months since we've been here, I think the community has a pretty good idea of all the aspects that we're working on. And those few one-off questions um, get asked still and our mayor speaks for council when it comes to when we have a question that is based on what council decision is about to be or is or when he is good at answering that um, to the, the residents where we kind of get caught up and we keep fielding those questions. We encourage them. We we love them because it allows us to to keep, you know, tabs and what people really want. So. I'm going to flip the script up a little bit because I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when it comes to municipalities. <laughs> so I've got to ask the flip question, which is what, what does Ingersoll get right? What is the thing that when you go to AMO conferences, when you go to Roma conferences, you boast about to other municipal leaders about what Ingersoll is doing right? Get into businesses in. <laughs> We're trying to get the industrial lands prepped. Permitting uh, Ingersoll is your greatest, you know, decision right now. We're right on the highway. We're a small town. We're creating a business community of industrial. Uh, we have a unique set that have been here forever, and they've grown at this location. They've expanded, um, and we still have more land that people are expanding within their old. Uh, infrastructure into a bigger one within Ingersoll. So we're still supporting businesses that way. Uh, we have GM who in the last, the first thing GM actually did was announce that retrofit uh, as soon as we got elected. So it was our first big news and we were at Roma feeling very excited about that. Uh, even the premier mentioned Ingersoll on stage. So we were put on the map right away. <laughs> and so that was kind of our our way of being significantly recognized that we are a location that everyone is looking at and we're fielding a lot of interest because of that. So I think that would be what I would say we're really proud of. Awesome. So we're trying to balance a business community with the local residents, yeah. So I'm cautious of time and I want to turn to my favorite subject now because I, as I've just mentioned, I'm coming to Ingersoll this summer and yeah. I am a massive fan of tourism. I think tourism, tourism, tourism is something that more municipalities should be promoting. Uh, as, as an elected official, what do you recommend to tourists who are coming to your community? What should they do while in Ingersoll? <laughs> oh man, we've got so much to offer whether it's coming through and staying at the Elmhurst where we've got some real history. Uh, it's right on the highway. It's beautiful, home comforting kind of feel when you come to the Elmhurst and we have the cheese museum right there on the highway. It's the most Can we talk beautiful. about this cheese museum? <laughs> because everyone I talk to from your area talks about this beautiful cheese museum. It, well, is it literally a just a cheese museum? <laughs> Well, it's 150 year old of history. Uh, once upon a time, this region was known for the biggest cheese ever, you know, made. And the fact that we still have, you know, the, the infrastructure where that cheese was being made, we've got all this history. We've got a local school there that shows you how it used to be. Um, when you consider that some kids call us in our middle age now dinosaurs, 
this is huge to see how people lived 50, 100 years ago is huge. And and we've got this wonderful park, you know, the cheese, you know, park there where it's just it's just the symbol of the town now because we have so much history there. And people come from all over the world to see our cheese museum. Uh, we've got visitors from the States. We've got visitors from even Toronto. Buses come in, you know, with, you know, chattered buses come to Ingersoll just to see and experience the museum. And it's been it's been upgraded. It's been uplifted with some new, you know, to, basically we've got new staff that have just kind of put a fresh coat on it and a fresh perspective on how we're sharing our, our museum. And I think when you have so much happening and you can add more flavor over time, it becomes a real big deal. And I think I'm really proud of the Cheese Museum and what it does and the fact that we still have busy footprint every single day is amazing. And it just shows you how much people are interested in our history. And so, yeah, when you leave the Cheese Museum, we've got places in town where we talk about our food and the diversity in the food uh, that we have. Um, I once had the African restaurant and unfortunately doesn't exist in Ingersoll on the main downtown front anymore, but we've got everything from the Thai cuisine to the Chinese, to the Indian, to the, we now have a new shawarma joint and we've got, you know, the regular uh, Dino's and, and Louis pizzas and all the old standard ones that we've had. So there's a variety of food as well. Um, and, you know, in neighboring uh, farm communities, we've got Leap and Deer. It's a beautiful farm community that still um, hosts kids in the summer and, and offers some baked goods fresh off the farms. And um, you, you go into anywhere around us, you'll find something to do, something to do. And, and those are the key favorites that I like. And, and, you know, with that, you'll get the connections to others. But, yeah. Where do you go? After, where do you go after a stressful day? After a long day of council um, meetings, after a long day of just doing what you need to do to make your community better, is there a spot in the community you can just go and decompress and just let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning you'll have to wake up and do it all over again? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll fair to a new business because that's where I've kind of found a nice sweet spot. Now we have a new evergreen coffee shop that has been my latest go-to place. And even though I'm so busy, I don't really get to hang out. Um, I've made it a point to, to, to go there and just take a deep breath. Um, and a lot of people tell you Joker's Crown, you know, once upon a time, it was one beautiful new pub and, and restaurant that opened and it's still given people that variety when they come in, you can sit out, you can dine in during COVID, it was really popular. Um, and uh, yeah, the old bakery cafe got a new owner and it became a, a new destination to try same and old, but new and fresh. Um, so yeah, we do have a lot of secession happening in Ingersoll as well with businesses that you're finding the same businesses might even give you a different flavor, a different flair which is still the reason why if you came here 10 years ago and you're here again, you're going to feel, oh my God, it's fresh, it's different, it's beautiful. And that's what's happening. So we're really supporting our downtown with those kinds of um, um, excitement and new businesses happening. We've got new clothing stores we didn't really have before when I got here. And there are places that people come to now just because they offer something unique. So it's really beautiful to see um, what's happening. I have one last question for you, and it's the million dollar question that ends this every interview I've ever had. And I think it's one mm -hmm. that every municipal leader knows how to answer, but I just like to ask it because I like to put it on the record. In your opinion, yeah. what makes the town of Ingersoll such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Ingersoll is so unique because it's a beautiful place that balances live, work, and play. Uh, as you have heard in my conversation, there is a balance between what people want when it comes to housing. They also have the same attention and focus on needing a recreational center where they want to, you know, meet each other and play. And we also recognize that a business thriving community helps support those of us that are here so that we can support local. And that's why any new business that comes gets that wonderful support and excitement from local residents as well. Um, so when you come here, you'll find a very close knit community uh, that tries to be supportive of each other. And, and you'll see council really trying to recognize all those needs and trying to balance it out. 
Um, the bigger businesses help us provide jobs. So again, that balance is there where you don't have to leave the town to go work in the bigger cities. You can live, work, and play in Ingersoll. And I think that's, to me, one of the biggest reasons why this is a wonderful place to live. Councillor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. I, I, I know I said 45 minutes and I think we just passed the 50 minute mark. So hopefully that's okay. Uh, I do yeah. appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, to sit down and do this, but I will also want to say thank you so much for serving your community. Uh, I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough, but I think it's high time that we start telling them. So thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you so much for being part of the Canadian democracy, but also the town of Ingersoll. Greatly appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you, Chris. And you have a wonderful day. And thank you for all you do for help, having voices, you know, be shared. So, yeah, good luck. If today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from the issues on municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage from coast to coast to coast, committed to keeping you well-informed and well-engaged on the issues affecting municipalities. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and as always, and most importantly, just keep talking.